so we're really pleased this month to be um, hosting our first Monday in partnership with um, our friends at Fabrica Gallery. And shortly after we closed the festival, Fabrica Gallery had um, run an open call for their really unique exhibition space, which is in the window of their brilliant building in the heart of Brighton, um, right in the middle of the shopping quarter um, in the South Lanes. And um, it's a huge window and they run an exhibition space called In Between Gallery. Um, and that's run in partnership with also Spectrum Photographic Lab and Loop Magazine. Zine, um, as well as ourselves and and it's an opportunity that Fabrica run for early career to mid-career photographers so everyone should watch out for the next open call um, Vera's work will be installed until April um, and so you should um, check out in, uh, in between gallery via Fabrica gallery um, and maybe register for their newsletter and you can look out for the next open call so I'm going to introduce Vera um, uh, so hello, <laughs> nice to meet everyone. There's so many people and it's lovely to see some familiar faces in the crowd as well. Um, before I begin with kind of like talking about my work, I really wanted to thank Fabrica Gallery and Photo Fringe as well as Spectrum and Loop Magazine um, for this amazing opportunity. And it's a really an honor to have been chosen for the in-between gallery. Um, I actually haven't seen the image in person, but the um, photograph uh, I was sent of it looks amazing. So I'm really excited. Um, so today I'm gonna share a bit more about the project with the name of a flower, uh, which is where the um, image chosen for Fabrica is from. Um, so this is the image that was selected. Um, and as Claire mentioned, like it's really hard to submit just one image for an open call. Um, but this image has been a key part of the project. Um, so I just um, submitted that one. Um, um, the project itself um, explores the forced name changes of Bulgarian Muslims um, throughout a long period of time in Bulgaria, spanning from 1912 till uh, 1989 um, with the fall of communism and looks at how those events have affected not only the people who experienced them, but also um, the younger generations following after that. Um, and my work in general um, gets a lot of inspiration from my own experience and my family history. Um, so a lot of the events I've looked at um, are things that my family has gone through. Um, and it's um, an interesting process because um, I discovered those things when I started purposefully digging in my family history. It wasn't something that was um, passed down to me. Um, so it was really um, hard to kind of like break into, break the surface and cr create work about it. Um, my work in general deals with issues of uh, identity, history, and memory. And I like exploring, as I said, events that um, are very personal and related to my family, but that connect to uh, the wider Bulgarian history and how that's impacted a lot of people throughout the whole country, nationwide. Um, seeing how that's influenced um, generations in terms of their sense of identity and belonging, whether it's cultural, religious, or national identity. Um, I'm Throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be showing uh, the project with the name of a flower. Um, and my work is very fluid. So I'm still kind of working and developing that project. So you will see images that I've kind of like added later on in the process. Um, and you can also see the um, images I'm going to be showing in the online exhibition, uh, which I did at Photo Fringe. Um, so this is an archival image from my family. And in the photograph I submitted for in the film gallery, I'm wearing uh, this dress, which is part of a traditional uh, Bulgarian dress that belonged to uh, my grandmother, Vera. Um, 
and I was named after her. However, she had a Muslim name before I was born, which she was forced to uh, change in the 1970s. Um, so this is only part of the traditional dress. Usually you have a cardigan and uh, an apron, um, but it's the only part of her uh, dress that I had left. So I wanted to commemorate that by using it in self-portraiture. Um, so this is the grandma. She is uh, third from the right. <laughs> That's my grandma Vera. And in the middle is um, her mother and the rest are like the six sisters. Um, and it, a lot of um, the stories I've heard from fam family members are what kind of like drives my creative process. Um, both sides of the family have um, a lot of memories that are kind of uh, buried and I've been trying to unearth them. Um, and it might sound uh, ignorant to, to a point, but uh, until like five or six years ago, I didn't consciously know that my family uh, was Muslim, that we have like Muslim background. Um, because it was never spoken about openly in my family. Um, we have, we've been celebrating like Ramadan and like along with the Christian holidays, some of the Muslim holidays, but it was never explained to us as kids uh, why we're celebrating or what we're celebrating. So I've just um, always uh, taken it as something normal and never questioned it. So for me, it was like um, a process of um, self-discovery and kind of like, discovering a, a different part of my identity that I never knew existed, kind of like digging into heritage and family memories and that collective memory that's accumulated but have been suppressed with time. Um, the way I create projects is um, very uh, instinctive and some Sometimes the images come first. For example, these photographs I took um, before the start of my MA, or when I knew I was starting a project and I was brainstorming ideas. I was in Bulgaria um, interviewing like my relatives very informally, uh, trying to learn more about their past and their stories. Um, and the way I came across the um, name changes was that uh, my grandparents would just mention it um, like offhand, just mentioned that they had um, different names before. And I started wondering like, why? Like I never questioned it before because I, they haven't spoken about it that much, but it just struck me that uh, this was something that was externally caused. And I wanted to learn more about it because it was very surreal to me for so many people to be forced to um, have their names changed. Um, so I also work with archival documents, and this is a, a name changing request form, which I found in the state archive in Smolen, Bulgaria. Um, so on it, it says um, basically request, and you need to fill in your name, and at the bottom says, please, can I have my name changed from, you fill in your uh, current name, and then to, you have to fill in a state approved name. Um, and to me, that was mind boggling because there were so many folders of filled in uh, request forms in the state archive. Um, and I could actually find um, request forms that different family members had sent uh, in the 70s. Um, and it was just, <laughs> um, just blew my mind finding those documents and thinking that people I know have actually filled them in in the past. And it's like, immersing yourself in history and reliving it. Um, but what fascinated me is that um, nobody um, was comp like, um, compensated for having their names changed. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with these request forms where it um, makes it seem that everything was voluntary, <laughs> even though I don't think anyone would believe that such a large part of the Bulgarian population would just um, voluntarily change their names out of nowhere. Um, this is another document that I found, which was a blank notebook filled in with, on the left side, the um, 
Muslim names of people and on the right side, the names, the Bulgarian names they were changed to. Um, and it had no reference to when it was written. Um, obviously it was around the 1970s because it was in that general folder, but it just fascinated me. And I created an installation using it, which I'm gonna try and play the video. It probably won't have sound, um, but you will find the link in the chat for it later on. Um, so this is uh, an installation I created using those documents uh, to represent just a small part of all the people who were forced to change their names. Um, and as I said, kind of like I create work in with many different um, media. So um, I always try to find the best medium that can fit the idea or the, um, the message I want to portray. Um, so the sound that you can hear on this, which you can later watch if you like, is the um, sound installation I created for um, my project and it's called Whisper. Um, and it consists of um, four channel uh, sound installation and every, um, channel has a recording of different relatives whispering a, a collection of the old Muslim names I've collected from my family. Uh, and for me, it was really important to use those names, even though um, a lot of my family members don't um, use their Muslim names anymore. Uh, but it was something that for me was very important because of that forced element of having to um, give up those names. Um, so I, I tried to uh, collect as many names of family members, Muslim names, as I could. Um, and some of them, um, obviously I interviewed relatives and asked how further back that goes because there were many name changing campaigns. Um, and the ones I'm focusing in this project are mainly in the 1970s, um, which is when my family got their names changed. Um, So this is um, another part of the project, which is they all mixed together and work with photography, um, archival documents, sound installations. Um, and recently I've started incorporating some new imagery, um, which some are film, some are digital. Um, the one, what I want to continue exploring um, with the project is um, different uh, people's personal stories um, and how they've affected, uh, how the name changes have affected them and um, their like descendants. Because when I was uh, creating this work, uh, I was uh, taking a lot from my own personal experience and uh, that experience was not knowing my past. So I, I had that lack of, um, knowledge in terms of where parts of my heritage was coming from. Um, and one of my cousins was a very contrasted case to me because her side of the family um, had preserved that knowledge of the uh, name changes and they were very much against them, um, as were many people, but like their part of the family passed that down to their children. And she grew up knowing all that uh, history, old family history, uh, the fact that uh, we're Muslim, etc. And uh, I was just fascinated with the difference between how both of us identified um, and our sense of like identity and belonging. So that made me uh, become even more curious about how um, people uh, experience this in a very personal level. So they didn't want to generalize everything because you can never do that. Um, and through the process of like researching and traveling around Bulgaria to visit different relatives, I um, experienced like how everyone has a different opinion about what happened. Like not everyone um, has uh, such a negative opinion about it, but um, a lot of this project is 
uh, obviously created through my own lens and my own personal experience of finding out about the name changes and just being baffled of how this could have happened in Bulgarian history to so many people. Um, so it is um, on one on one side trying to raise awareness and portray uh, those historical events, but on the other side, um, showcasing how a person who's like not lived through it uh, is can be still affected by it, like looking at the post memory of these events. Um, and a lot of my work, I use myself as a subject in my uh, photography. Um, part of the reason is because I find it um, easier to try and convey something using myself instead of other people. And also because it's such a delicate subject and a lot of people in Bulgaria are still um, unwilling to share um, their memories and experiences about it it makes it hard to actually use um, portraits of people. Um, I have a collection of portraits of relatives, but I feel very protective of them. And I still haven't uh, found out the balance of um, whether to use them or not, or how to incorporate them in the work. So this is something I'm still working on. Um, so this is a performance video I created. Um, again, using the Muslim Muslim names and Bulgarian names of my relatives. And this is, of course, just a selection of the names. Um, I wanted to make something that would um, showcase that erasure that happened during that time. Um, that forceful like erasure of the Muslim names and replacing them with state approved ones. Um, so in the video, which you can front page, um, I am writing the Muslim names of my relatives and then erasing them by hand and then rewriting on top the names, they, um, the, their Bulgarian names. Uh, and the video is 16 minutes. There is an ex excerpt from it, um, which uh, you can see in the photo fringe exhibition as well. So both videos I've shown so far, you can see in the French online exhibition. And this is the blackboard I used after I erased all the names. So my grandma, um, that's my uh, maternal grandmother, uh, her name's Rena, um, but she's been a big part of my work throughout not only um, the with the name of a flower project, but um, throughout previous work as well. Um, like her and my grandfather, um, they're the, the only grandparents that are still alive. Um, and they've been like their lives and their stories have inspired like all my work throughout, as well as uh, more recently with with the name of a flower, um, interviewing uh, other relatives as well. So it's something I want to continue developing and create, um, basically showcase the different experiences in a more um, personal uh, level by telling the stories and it. This is a video that starts You can view it later on. Uh, but in it, my grandma is performing a kind of like a ritual um, that um, is meant to take away like the evil eye, the evil spirit. If you're feeling unwell, sometimes it's performed to like make you feel better. Um, and it's something that I've grown up with, like she's always done it, like if, if we're feeling unwell, she just does it to us and you kind of like makes you feel better. Um, but what I found out is that actually she is uh, reciting part of the Quran. So it's like using that Muslim heritage um, in like everyday life. And it's something I didn't even know was connected to that. 
um however the the ritual bane like it's a also like kind of like a pagan thing like a lot of christian bulgarians do it as well so it's it's something that's uh, permeated throughout like regardless of the religious um regardless of the religion uh bulgarian people um do that in many different ways uh to kind of like ease and um heal um so you can view the, the video later on Um, and I've also started incorporating pictures of other relatives. As I said, I'm still very protective of um, of, show, of sharing my relatives because the stories are so personal um, and I, I want them to feel comfortable uh, with me actually using them. But this is my grandfather's sister and she took, took me and my uh, parents to uh, Chamla, which is the village where my grandfather's uh, grand grandparents um, are from. And the village is no longer inhabited. Like it's um, old houses there in ruin, and it's um, a fate of many uh, mountain villages in Bulgaria. Um, a lot of um, the depopulation of these areas is was caused by like political and like social economic reasons. Um, but it's amazing to see that there's like a lot of the people there um, still living and. It was um, just breathtaking seeing all the houses in ruin um, and like kind of like part of history disappearing slowly with time. Um, so I wanted to go through some images from exhibitions because um, when I create work, I see it um, in a space. So I create for the work to be exhibited and experienced in a like a physical space. Um, so this was um, my graduate exhibition from my MA in the University of Portsmouth. It's in Four Corners Gallery in London. Um, so I had the space to myself. And you can see the different elements of the project um, throughout the space. And the four plants you see here, this is the sound installation, Whisper, um, that I mentioned. Um, and from each speaker, there's a different um, uh, person's voice coming, whispering. And it's, I really can't explain it, but it's uh, something that has to be experienced in, in a space. Um, having like, um, you can imagine like walking around the space and hearing just whispering from different parts of the room. Um, and the um, headscarves I'm using to cover them are traditional like Bulgarian uh, headscarves that um, would be, the reason that uh, there, there are two um, heights of the plinths is to represent that um, those headscarves were used and still are used very proudly as part of the traditional Bulgarian Lucia, like the traditional folk dress. Um, however, at a certain point it was forbidden for people to wear them for uh, religious, religious reasons, like um, to cover their heads. So is that um, um, clashing of the context? And um, yeah, I found it really fascinating. Um, so I've also shown the work in Bulgaria, which um, is definitely um, a different, um, and I always consider the context of the country I'm showing. Uh, for example, in London, I was aware that not many people would know the historical background, so I provided um, leaflets with information about each piece from the project, so people can learn a bit more about history and uh, the work, um, because it's otherwise I feel like the viewer would, would be a bit lost. Um, so this exhibition is um, during the festival Night Quilted. And um, another exhibition, the work was selected for Circulations Festival uh, last year. <laughs> and this is in Paris. Um, 
which it opened right before the pandemic started. So I was actually able to go to Paris and install um, the work and exhibit. So you can see like the work changes in every context. So the archival installation here has a completely different look with like the whole wall being filled with archival documents to represent the um, like the scale of how many people were forced to change their names. And um, something I would consider is that not everyone will know the historical background. So I created this publication um, that includes um, photographs from my work as well as three articles that provide context for the work. Um, I commissioned the Bulgarian historian uh, Evgeny Ivanova to write a very brief introduction to the name changes and the history of the name changes in Bulgaria, not only in the 1970s, but spanning from the start till um, uh, the end of um, these events, um, to just present it for general viewer uh, to get a better idea of um, um, the history of the name changes. Um, there's also an excerpt from um, a name changing book, um, a book that was published in the 1970s, which was uh, contained suggested uh, state group names, Bulgarian names. Um, and I included the introduction to that book, translated both in English and Bulgarian, um, to provide um, a context for how um, the government then addressed the name changes and tried to persuade people to change their names. Um, there's also a, an article by myself, a little essay, um, presenting the work from my own perspective. Um, and I still have copies of the publication, so if you're interested, just let me know. Um, and to now showcase um, the latest exhibition um, of the work, this is the Fabrica in between gallery. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it in person. I really hope I can go to Brighton soon. <laughs> Um, some other things I'm working on at the moment, I really hope to create a work in progress line, um, kind of like expanding the project um, and trying to incorporate stories, archival images and uh, photographs from my travels to Bulgaria uh, and just have it use it as a playground to expand the work and build upon the narrative that's already created. Um, it's really difficult because uh, when I was creating with the name of a flower, uh, that was during my master's degree in the University of Portsmouth, and I would travel to Bulgaria every two or three months for a couple of weeks. I would take all my equipment, um, like photograph, interview people, record videos, like basically try and uh, gather all the material I could in my short time when I was in Bulgaria. Um, and since I graduated in 2019, I haven't been able to actually visit Bulgaria and then the pandemic happened and that extended, like I haven't been to Bulgaria for more than a year now. And that makes it really hard to create work, obviously, because all my work is uh, created in Bulgaria and I get a lot of my inspiration from being with my family and just immersing myself in that environment. So it's really uh, challenging, but I'm hoping to work with more like archival materials and hopefully soon I'll be able to visit. <laughs> um, in like upcoming um, kind of events I'm part of, I was selected for Aspects Emergency Exhibition uh, last year and it's uh, it was postponed to this year so fingers crossed it will uh, happen at some point this year um, so you can find out more about it I think uh, Claire will share the link with um, there's seven other artists selected it's going to be a group show and hopefully we'll all be able to see it soon this year 
Um, and another thing, I um, just want to mention that Workshop Grow School um, is um, just uh, launched their first publication and I'm part of the school. So one of my images is part of the publication and I can't wait to receive my copy. So if you're interested to get one, the publication is filled with like um, more than 100 artists work from more than like 20 countries. And it's filled with positivity and different advice for creatives. Uh, everyone basically sharing their knowledge and experience and kind of like supporting each other. So it's, it's, the publication is free, it's just you pay for postage. So I just want to mention that as well. If you want the boost of positivity through your mail. Um, and um, kind of lastly, I also run a peer to peer feedback group um, every month or so, which is um, just a gathering of artists and sharing um, work in progress and discussing uh, getting feedback from each other to kind of like develop um, work um, and just get advice. Like it's a very friendly open space. So let me know if you're interested in joining. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Vera. Should I stop sharing now? Uh, yeah, we're going to put all of those um, links that you have on screen in the chat. So um, that's good. Oh, I'm just going to, we've had lots of questions. So I have some uh, myself. Something I forgot to mention, sorry. Yes, no, go ahead. Um, today is actually the day of remembrance for the yeah. Uh, victims of the communist regime in Bulgaria. So I find, found it very fitting that I'm talking about events that happened during the communist regime. Um, so yeah, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know and sharing. Um, thank you so much, Barry. <laughs> Have a sip. You, uh, you've been, that was a really great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump straight into some questions because um, we have a really nice busy chat. Um, box. Um, there's a question first from Paul Carey Kent. Um, he said, asks, have you concentrated only on women? And if so, why? Um, not intentionally, um, but the work I've presented is um, only women. I do have images of my uh, male relatives as well, but it, I think um, women in general are more the keepers of the family history in families, is what I've noticed. So um, I, I have worked more with women, like interviewing like female relatives. Um, but it's not, um, it's not intentional that I've included on women. Okay. Um, in your, in, in the video, in fact, um, the names notebook in terms of content that it's mixed the names is that correct from both genders uh yes yes definitely yeah um okay a question from um rachel capavilla um beautiful and interesting i'm really interested in your camera equipment and choices of what and how you use it please yeah there was a few other questions about kit as well that's a very good question. Um, so when I was creating the work, I was still in university. So I used, I borrowed the equipment from uni. <laughs> so if you're in uni, definitely make use of their equipment. But um, for the film photos, I used a Mamiya C330. Um, it's a twin lens reflex camera. It's probably one of my favorite cameras. And I'm looking to buy one to have, because I currently like don't have one. Um, but yeah, I, I love the um, film camera and like, it just puts me in a completely different mindset for shooting work when you're not like looking through the like digital um, viewfinder, but you're like kind of looking down on the whole image to um, the film camera and it just, I don't know, it just puts you in a different mindset when, you, when you're shooting and knowing that you only have certain um, um, numbers of frames that you can use makes you more conscious of how you position everything, at least for me. Um, I, I find that I shoot very differently on digital and on film. So I prefer to work on film because it makes me more uh, considerate and more um, kind of like aware of what I'm um, creating. 
Um, but in terms of the videos, again, equipment we need is a Canon 6D digital camera. And like I've used throughout like different lightings for the Blackboard video, I had um, uh, LED like lighting from both sides. Um, because yeah, a, a sound recorder as well, a really good one from university. I think it's an HD Zoom sound recorder. Did you use that for the names notebook with the whispering? Yeah, that, <laughs> that was really tricky to yeah. record <laughs> because the sound recorder catches like so much sound, like even the, the quietest um, sound. So every like uh, moving of um, a paper or shuffling of something like gets recorded. So I had to make uh, my relatives be like really, really quiet and like re-record, like I would record and listen and like, oh no, again. <laughs> So yeah, it, it was probably not that fun for them, but um, I'm like really grateful that they um, humored me and actually helped with the creating. Did you, did you say they were covering their mouths as well when, when you filmed that to aid the whispering sound or no? No, no. I'm obviously completely distracted by mask wearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to pick up on the last, um, the last question um, that you just answered in regards to your kit. Um, I'm just going to jump ahead in our um, <clears throat> list of questions slightly from Ilari Clancy, who said, um, I've noticed you have used a square format for most of your work. I was just wondering whether this was due to using film, maybe medium format, or if it is digital. By the way, love your work so much. It's beautiful, very humbling. Um, is there anything else you want to say around the square format or? Um yeah it's um just the camera i use is square format but i find that i really like the square um and i've just developed a way of like seeing the images in square now um i don't know there's something very charming about the square photographs um but yeah the twin the film camera i used is twin lens reflex so it's sh uh, shoots like six by six yeah um, sure. but as you see some of the um, some of the images I'm kind of like adding to the project, uh, looking into the materials I've collected. Some of them are um, rectangular, so a few of them are digital, the things yeah. that I'm adding now. And you, we can maybe talk at the end, but you said you, you, you've kind of presented already both in exhibition and online in exhibition. Um, so in physical and online exhibition spaces, different iterations from the, the body of work, different edits, or you've curated them differently for the spaces. Um, and it might be nice just to hear about that, sort of what, how, how do you go about that? And I guess that begs the question around, um, is this body of work continuous? Do you, uh, there's a question here about, do you see yourself ever completing this series? Um, so how what's the relationship between sort of continuing the work and then presenting it in these different edits mm -hmm. um just to answer the question of um, continuing the work first um i real realized really early on when i discovered the kind of like topic about the name changes that this is something that i'm probably going to work on for a, a long time um and it's something i definitely want to continue exploring because it's such a rich and like broad topic that I feel like I've only scratched the surface. Like I want to like dig into it more, like learn more and create more work about it. Um, uh, in terms of showing like exhibiting work, um, one of my passions is to actually um, be a curator, and I've tried to uh, like I love creating exhibitions. Like for me, the experience of artwork in an actual space uh, is like can be like um, replicated online. Like I love going to exhibitions and experiencing like artworks. And the way I try to uh, exhibit my work and curate it is every time is based on the space it's going to be in. So considering how people would go around the space, uh, figuring out where to put which which element of the work so it can create a better narrative for the viewer, kind of like immersing them in the project and kind of like giving them different parts of the story uh, throughout their experience of the whole um, exhibition space. So, um, yeah, and it's, it definitely depends on the space and the context 
um, for example, in Bulgaria, um, I showed um, the one of the archival documents I showed in England and Paris was the blank um, name changing form. Um, the one I showed in Bulgaria was a, a bit more like a name changing form, but for a family, because uh, it had a lot more like text in it. Um, and I think it's, um, yeah, definitely considering the context, a lot of people in Bulgaria were aware of that history, but at the same time, not that many were. Like this is um, part of Bulgarian history that isn't taught in schools. So not many uh, young people know it. So it's still something that's only recently started to resurface and be a bit more well known. Yeah, um, that was and a having conversations uh, is really important, like bringing the past uh, up because it still affects us. Mm -hmm. And when you did that exhibition in Bulgaria, um, Vera, did you have the opportunity to to speak to do a talk around it? One of the questions, actually, from Elisa Morris Vai is, um, how did people react in Bulgaria to the project? Did it help others to speak about this past? Yeah, um, I love like when whenever I'm exhibiting, I love actually staying at the exhibition and talking to visitors. Uh, and I find that every time I talk to people, I start sharing like some personal story that is not included in the project, but it just brings up memories and they start sharing their own uh, family history and how uh, they can relate to like the experience. Um, in Bulgaria, definitely was like very powerful experience. Um, the exhibition lasted three nights. So it was like during the night um, and there were so many people that came in all of the nights. Like I was, um, met um, a lot of like Bulgarian Muslim people. There were Turkish people as well, whose names were changed like in the last name changing campaign in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them were sharing their experiences of either like their parents or grandparents or um, them like kind of finding out later on in life that when they were little, they had a Bulgarian name because their parents weren't allowed to name them with Muslim names. And like it's been changed and their name now is like uh, Muslim, but before it wasn't, and it's only now that they're finding that out. And it's like so many uh, stories of different people that it was um, amazing being immersed in that environment and having uh, so many people share their own stories. It was like um, another part of the research that I wanna just um, connect to those people again and basically um, get their experience and um, share their stories as well. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, I'm trying to keep my eye on the questions as well because it's, it's it's really um, great. There's so many. Um, let me just quickly flick through. I think we answered um, your question, Frank, um, but do message me if we didn't about um, how you know when you have finished the project. I think Vera just spoke a little bit about how it's continuing. Um, a uh, message from Helen. Um, can you talk more about your images of interiors and empty spaces? They are very beautiful and feel very intimate. Where were they shot and how do they relate to your family history and name changes? Um, I can maybe share the presentation. Sure. Yeah, have in. Great. Um, so all of the work is shot in Bulgaria. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna... Um, and a lot of it is shot in my like family home. Um, yeah. in, um, one of the flats where my grandparents used to live, it was uh, empty when I was visiting. And it was basically my last chance to photograph there because after that we had, um, there's people that live there now. So it was like a very coincidental, like serendipitous moment where I was there and I was able to kind of like photograph that. Um, that environment, um, like also the coat I wear, like this dress um, belongs to my mom and I think like my grandmother bought it for her. So it's like those kind of like um, furniture and everything that's very socialist and it's from, from that time. Um, like all these furniture are, have been there for like years. This is where my grandparents used to live, like it's their, their like space, their environment. So I feel like a lot of that contributes to the work because it feels like it's created during that time. Just mm -hmm. like all the, 
but in terms of um, I how I perceive images or like the empty spaces, I feel like a lot of that emptiness is kind of like trying to represent the uh, erasure and that lack, that um, the emptiness that's been created uh, in part in people's identities, that the erasure of or like hiding of the Muslim side of their identity. Um, yeah. yeah. But, um, Sorry. Did I answer the question? <laughs> oh, you did. Sorry. Yeah, I was just really thinking about the use of color and whether that's sort of it's come from the spaces that you're working in, but you have this, you know, this particular use of color throughout this um, project, and whether that's more intentional and directed than um, than incidental. Uh, maybe a bit of both, uh, because this is the space, like this is what I was working with, so the color is actually mm. uh, inherent in it. Um, but um, the fact that I work in color is a choice. I, um, I'm i drawn to colorful images and I'm, I can't really work in black and white. Um, yeah, I think just the environment I work with have that um, uh, like the natural light and the different colors are just inherent in them. Mm. Yeah. And I'm just drawn to it. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Vera. Uh, so there's one more question. Oh, there's two more here. Um, <laughs> so from Hannah, um, are there any books or resources you can recommend that speak further about the topics you explore of Bulgarian history? Um, if there's any that you know off the top of your head, you can share now, or um, I guess we can pop you in touch afterwards. Both of them are in Bulgarian. Okay. So most of my research was done in Bulgaria and like different libraries. So all of the resources that talk about the history of the name changes um, in that period, um, most of them are in Bulgarian. Um, I can look uh, into it and actually um, give you a few. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we can save the chat feed so I can share this with you afterwards and um, we can put you in touch. So maybe that's a, a good way to connect. Um, and then finally, um, Lois Holland asked, what film do you use? Um, throughout the series, I've used Coda Portra, either 200 or 400 as well. Um, sorry, not 200, 260. But yeah, Coda Portra. Um, I think a lot of photographers use that film, like, don't know if there's um, anything special about it. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Well, we're, um, we're just coming up to the hour. So that's all. That's all the questions. That's fantastic. Thanks again to um, Vera. Hold on. Thank you, Vera. What a very, what a nuanced beauty your pictures have. I can't wait to see the image in Fabrica. Thank you, Ezra. Um, and I'm sure you're going to get lots more comments. So I'll just leave the chat open. Uh, it's really nice. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as Vera said, she has um, a publication of the um, uh, a publication of the book. Thank you, Vera. <laughs> What did we put on screen? I was going to ask you for a picture, but that's very good. You can flick through the book um, and you can go straight to Vera's um, website, verahajiska.com and um, purchase the book there. Um, and then um, you can find out also just by following Vera for, for the forthcoming um, shows. So uh, again, just to remind you that um, at Fabrica, the um, yellow dress is exhibited till April and um, you have the upcoming exhibition aspects watch that space um, pending uh, pandemic developments um, <laughs> or not developments hopefully um, okay so thank you very so much um, I'm just thank you for joining thank you for the opportunity <laughs>